around COVID in the last year? And then we'll go back to Ron. Sure, well, I'll defer to our health commissioner, Kay Farrar, to give the statistics. But I will say it's been really important for me. Kay has done a, an excellent job of providing information to our community. At each of our council meetings, she has given uh, very thorough reports, which has clearly shown to me the disparity in the populations that are receiving the COVID vaccine, which is very, very troubling for me. And so I appreciate how all of our health commissioners have come together to provide the information. Um, certainly I encourage everyone to get the vaccine, but I've seen clearly the disparities that there are. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, Rhonda Croucher just said that her connection is frozen and muted. And she said if this did happen during our panel session, she might try to just dial in. I know that limits our ability to include her. Um, I am aware that Primary Health Solutions has been involved uh, with looking at communities at risk. They primarily serve a Medicaid population and the underserved, that is their focus and we're grateful to have them in the community. Dr. Hamilton, I will shift to you as it relates to students in Miami University and any information that you may be aware of of how the university is reaching out to communities of color and especially as it relates to COVID. And I know that you'll only be able to speak to the regional, but I think it's important. Dr. Hamilton, are April, can you unmute Benice? Thank you, April. I, I, it, would, it wasn't working for me. I know that, that uh, Miami University has been very vigilant with um, keeping us informed as faculty and staff about what is happening in our community at, in addition to what is happening on our campuses. Um, on the regionals, we are a commuter campus. So we only hear about our students uh, as they tell their professors and, and so on and so forth. So we weren't getting a lot of numbers, but in Oxford, because most of the students live on campus, we were getting daily updates about the number of, of COVID cases that were reported and what the Oxford campus was doing to isolate students. Um, uh, the, the campus was also very proactive in how they went about um, protecting faculty and staff and, and making sure that social distancing was in place and that every office had masks and, and disinfectants and, and all of that. But <clears throat> so I, I'd like to say that, that Miami's done a really good job of, of not just keeping us informed, but also keeping us safe in the midst of, of the crisis, because we know early on that Butler County was a hotbed as well for the number of cases of, of uh, COVID infected people. So I, I think that the campus has done a terrific job. And in, in our office, we've had to adjust a bit. We used to have an office that was often full of students, but we want to keep our students safe too. So we took out lots of seats and lots of tables and, and all of that so that students are always at least six feet apart, but we still want them to know that they're welcome in the space. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Rhonda, if you're able to participate, April can unmute you. And then you can speak to what Primary Health Solutions has been doing in the space during the pandemic relative to infection control and just treatment of, of COVID infected folks and then vaccine access, especially to communities of color. Certainly, and my apologies for our technical issues. I do hope that you can hear me, yes? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, as a community health center network, we felt the responsibility immediately to, of course, be community facing. And so what we did was um, actually utilize our mobile dental unit because we, we knew that we couldn't just wait for people to come to us. We had to get out in the community. And so we did um, take that out and, and move about the community in various locations in order to do testing. First, initially, we were able to quickly um, partner with all of the community, um, uh, the general health districts with, you know, the city commissioners and do so. Um, and I think Jackie, before I uh, left the room, was talking about that ability to inherently be a part of the, the fabric of the minority community and, and be effective. 
And, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't the case with us. And really the most effective work that we were able to do was um, in Montgomery County because we were able to partner with a pastor, community leader, who was the trust, you know, he had the trust factor. And so it allowed us to gain entry to um, the, the minority community that was being underserved. And so um, that was probably the biggest success in the testing arena for us. And then as vaccines became available, then we pivoted um, to do pretty much the same, be community facing uh, in our work and took it on the road. We were up in Oxford and all over Butler County. Um, and now we're looking at how we best serve uh, our 35,000 patients that look to us to be that source for health care. And um, that's currently where our focus lies with the underserved. And I appreciate you highlighting the issue of trust within communities, because what we know historically that especially African-American communities have been experimented on in this nation's history. And so there is an inherent distrust of, of new vaccines and and a concern about, am I gonna be harmed in some way? So I really appreciate you talking about the faith leader. And Jackie, to your um, focus and emphasis in, in Middletown, were there strategies that you used beyond your own connections to help address some of that mistrust? Okay, now, can you hear me? That, that mute button doesn't, you just don't click it. You have to click it about 10 times. So just FYI. So uh, yes, um, being, I am proud to say that I am lover of people, right? And as much as I get thin skin and get my feelings hurt or whatever, I always will bow down to getting the job done. And all of my communications, all of my connections, all of them were utilized from getting into the schools, to getting into the churches, to getting into Kiwanis and Rotary, because we were gonna do member 80 and over. So when we look at disparities, a lot of times they come with our elderly and our seniors as well. And so I wanted to make sure that every part of the community was touched when we talk about disparities and um, you have to utilize every piece of it. So we had white churches, black churches, Latino churches, every entity that I could see. And I kind of um, uh, 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 kind of was lenient, if you will, because it was if it was 80 and older at first, if you bought your 80 year old mom oh, and you were 75, I might have turned a blind eye. So I got the job done because um, I know that that's what you have to do. And I also know that's a good marketing tool, right? Because the more people you can vaccinate, the more people hear about vaccinations and the more people come to vaccinate. And so, and I like to, I mean, I got teary eyed when I heard Rhonda and Miami University, we just, I mean, and Kay, we really worked all together listened to everybody and worked with everybody. And so it was wonderful having all of those partners. And it just, when I get teary-eyed, it's because it's just all the strength that we have when we work together, right? Uh, it's just, so um, yeah, so I used all every, every strategy I could think of, because understand, we didn't get a lot of sleep in those first few days. <laughs> so, so we had a lot of time to think about strategies because we didn't sleep a whole lot, so. Thank you, Jackie. And we are trying to get Kay involved in this conversation, but I'm gonna take some liberties if I can as the facilitator and let you know that as a living and working in the city of Hamilton, um, Kay Farrar was amazing in connecting with us early on because we serve communities at very high risk. Mm -hmm. and she was careful to provide education. We had a couple of outbreaks early on that were just serendipitously discovered with pre-admission testing for a routine outpatient surgery. And Kay and her staff were phenomenal in getting us any wraparound services that we needed. And that included literally one of the firefighters showing up on our front doorstep with supplies, groceries, for our residents because they couldn't leave and we have a limited staff. 
And so to your point, Jackie, it's just tapping every resource that you possibly can. Mm -hmm. So that kind of response to um, disenfranchised individuals who are not going to trust easily helps build that sense of belief and faith that folks are acting to help. Mm -hmm. So when the vaccine was actually approved for emergency use, Kay and I communicated regularly. And I'm telling you, this woman answered my text late at night when it was dark and on Saturday morning. And I'm like, I don't know how she's getting any sleep. So to your point, those who are in healthcare, I don't think she was sleeping at all. That trust was already in place because of the work that had been done early on in the pandemic. So we were able to get almost 80% of our population back right away because of that. So I think we cannot say enough about how it takes all of us working together in order to help individual survive this pandemic. It's not over. And I think that is the key point as a nurse that I want to support my fellow colleagues on this call that we have to keep up the vigilance and keep up the vaccination rates as fast as we can to as many people as possible. And so I just say a thank you to all of you who have been committed to this. So the pandemic COVID vaccine rates here in living. What we also deal with in this part of our state though are and is the work around infant mortality and maternal mortality. And I'd like for you to speak to that, Jackie and, and Rhonda, relative to the work that we're doing in Butler County in the leading infant vitality equitably, some of the statistics that we're experiencing here. And I don't know if any of you have seen the most recent report that shows mm -hmm. working. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about that. Rhonda, I'll start with you this time and then I'll come back to Jackie. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, during the onset of the pandemic, there were a lot of wonderful initiatives that were going on in this community that were a part of the strategies of um, the partnership to reduce infant mortality, which um, has been at work for years in this community. Jackie, I think you were one of the founders. Um, and then also the live group and then just the different healthcare entities have begun to understand our need to move in this space critical need. And so we started groups like Centering Pregnancy and Centering Parenting. We did home visits where we were going in to assess the environment that these babes and moms were living in to see if there were things we could do to support and, you know, help assure that babies were getting to their first birthday. Um, PHS was doing the first pediatric visits in the home. So we were able to really get a sense of what it was like for this newborn and, and mama. And all of these efforts helped, I believe, um, you know, and again, it was a collective community effort, very focused to move the needle uh, in the right direction. And the good news is in 2019, that began to happen. And so that was really exciting for us. And as, you know, we were preparing our remarks, um, Tracy Bishop um, sent out um, the new, the 2020 data that's going to be released this week about infant mortality rates in Butler County. And I was really stunned, I have to be honest, because all of those initiatives that we knew were working actually had to go virtual or be ceased uh, in 2020. And so um, the good news is the needle continues to move downward. And that's so exciting because so many people have been working diligently literally for years to make that happen. Um, and, but the, the news is still that, you know, it, the black infant death has decreased, but black infants are still, and I'm looking at my paper, so I'm correct, you know, I quote correctly, 1.7 times more likely to die than white infants. And then um, 1.3 times more likely than Hispanic infants. So we have work to do for our minority populations, um, but the numbers are moving in the right direction. So that's exciting to talk about here in this space. Thank you, Rhonda. Jackie, can you speak to the work around improving infant mortality rates for communities of color, specifically black infants? Um, I am excited to hear that the numbers are decreasing. 
But I'm also what you started with, Wendy, when we talked about um, speaking George Floyd's name. I think it is important that we look at every time there is any kind of issue, it seems that um, disparities hit the African-American community harder. So that would imply that we have a problem with race relations in general, right? Because if you're gonna always have more people die of COVID that are brown or black, and then you're gonna have more babies die that are brown or black, more moms die that are brown or black. Um, if you think about life expectancy, lower life expectancies in brown and black. I mean, when you keep going, um, college education, everything. So you would have to realize that is systemic racism and it is a it's systemic problem. And so I just put down this note that how wonderful would it be when we get to the point that we can tackle an issue and not tackle the barrier. We always have to get around this barrier. We spend so much time and effort and energy getting around the barrier to get to the people, right? And what if we could just tackle that issue? If it was breast cancer, we could tackle breast cancer. We wouldn't have to say, let's find the women that, you know? And so as we move forward, this community has a lot of passionate women working towards that effort. And I applaud them and I praise them um, for doing so. And we have to keep that effort going. But it is, it's my fear that when we remove those efforts, do we come back to the same problem? Because we really haven't tackled the issue. Does that, that make sense, Wendy? It but does. I am so excited. Uh, we were just talking about our um, opiates. And when we kind of take our attention off that, we see an increase. And so we're probably fighting the wrong thing. We shouldn't have to have attention on those barriers. We should have attention on loving everyone and having equitable strategies always in place. So, yes. May I address that question? Please, Dr. Hamilton. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you to, to Jackie and Rhonda. And I know that you all are in the trenches. You're actually doing the work. And, but sometimes people need a different way instead of just giving us statistics and, and all of that because you have access to those. Sometimes it takes a different way to approach a topic. And one of the ways that I know the why has been involved and in, it's through a visual. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, there's a movie called Toxic, a black woman's story. And most of you, uh, many of you have heard of that, but it's a day in the life of a black woman. And this is a successful black woman um, who's also pregnant and some of the things that she has to go through. But for the audience that audiences that get to experience that movie, they get a visual of the statistic, a statistical information that both Jackie and Rhonda have been talking about. And I think sometimes that offers a very pragmatic solution because again, a picture is a thousand words, but it also means that I not only take it to the medical community, that's a movie that I go and I say, okay, Susan, I need you to see this because Susan is in one of those places that where change can, can be affected. Mm -hmm. So we show it to Susan and maybe a cohort of other politicians because it, it just becomes very a practical solution that says, this is what I've been talking about, but here's another way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, Councilwoman Vanna, I'll shift to you with that question or that um, segue in that policy is part of how we deconstruct systematic racism in our society. And we're interested as a group of leaning in women who understand these disparities in healthcare, education. Um, talk a little bit about your interest in this, in this work in the future. Sure, thanks Wendy. Well, I think for me personally, a declaration of um, the issue of racial disparity is the beginning of our community acknowledging the issue. And I think that's what's lacking. I think if you ask anyone, do you believe there are racial disparities? Sure. But I think to come forward and to declare this is an issue within our community is the opportunity for us to then have more discussions, not just 18 of us here today talking about this issue. It should be thousands of people acknowledging it. And I think um, 
you know, it gives us opportunities then to start talking and educating others about what are the opportunities to get involved? How do we make change? Um, we can create action steps, but having that overall declaration, I think is critical to any city, community, state, country moving forward. And unfortunately, not everyone is there. So I think we have to work hard to do that. You know, I've learned a lot from conversations with Wendy, from, you know, readings, things that I've done, that there's just no doubt in my mind that that is the right thing for, I'm gonna say our country to be doing, and then to start taking action. Um, ultimately, I think the idea is to be able to change through policy, through further conversations. And, you know, the more that I've read about this, that I believe that it's more about changing the social environment, the environments where we live and not people. And sometimes it frightens people when they think if you declare this is a problem, then we're going to have to change the way we believe. And that's not true. It's trying to find a solution. And so I believe changing social environments and neighborhoods, which is really what Hamilton's all about right now. I mean, Hamilton is uh, an organization called 17 Strong, where we try to connect neighborhoods. And we need to look at those neighborhoods where there are disparities, where um, we need to um, get more involved and bring it all together so that there's equity. So I, I feel very, very strongly about that. Thank you, Councilwoman Vaughn. And we appreciate your support. And in full transparency to the attendees and to the panelists, I have been having conversations and hoping to have racism declared a public health crisis in our city and in time within our entire county. What I want to share is that YWCA's across Ohio have been working in this space at least for the last 18 months. And this movement began in states that are surrounding us like Wisconsin and Michigan, but not necessarily in Ohio. But many of the large urban cities throughout the state have in fact already declared racism a public health crisis, as have our governor and his leadership team. So Governor DeWine has declared racism a public health crisis. What I espouse to all of you who are attending is that we want to start with that declaration because we know that's where real conversation begins. It can't be, to Susan Vaughn's point, a simple declaration that racism is a public health crisis. We need policy changes around that to reduce those disparities. <clears throat> and YWCA is committed to this activity. And this is part of what we're trying to do by today during Stand Against Racism Week, raise awareness around the disparities relative to the pandemic, relative to infant mortality rates in communities of color. April has alerted me that we believe we have the ability to draw in Kay Farrar so that she can speak to what's happening within the city. So with your patience, Kay, I'm gonna ask if you're able to talk a little bit about the work that you've been doing during the pandemic, how many hours a night you are actually sleeping and how you're addressing the access to communities of color if you can. I, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, awesome. Sorry about that. My computer does not have a um, microphone, nor does it have a camera. So I'm kind of stuck here on the phone, but I'm watching you on my computer. I can see you guys. Um, it has been a very, very, very difficult time, obviously, because we're a very small department, as Jackie's is, but we work and we work with passion. Um, and I hope that comes through. I work with passion every day. I've, um, this is a um, once in a lifetime thing, I hope. <laughs> I hope we don't have to do this again. Um, we are reaching out as best as we can. I will say I still believe our numbers are very low in the African American community with, vac with our vaccine rates. Um, and I report that to council regularly. We did have a um, vaccine day at Booker T. Washington on Friday. Um, the turnout was low. There were only 16 that came. However, I do believe those were 16 people who would not have otherwise sought out or gone to get vaccinated. So our initial 
pool for the vaccine, at least, was to get large numbers going so that we have a better chance of fighting this. We have, and this is this is Kay's world and Kay's mind. We had to get large numbers because there's variants out there. So I've completed that piece of it, and now we're moving into the community and smaller hubs. Um, meanwhile, we did do as many small hubs as we could, like. Like Wendy was saying, we did go to the Y. We went to Surf City quite a few times. We went to Haven, Center Haven. Um, we went to Dr. Moss's office, did quite a few people there. Um, so we've reached out to as many communities we, as we have been able to. We are now moving. We also did New Life missions. So we did a lot of homeless um, populations. We've been there a couple of times. Um, and now we are reaching out to other types of ways to get into the community. So we'll be at the Hamilton flea market. We will be, um, we're gonna go to the um, uh, Hyde's restaurant on Friday because a lot of elderly people eat there and go there for the pie. So we're trying again <laughs> to just go outside the box because that's how I, like Jackie, you know, we, it, it's time to think outside the box to reach people um, where we may not traditionally think of reaching them. And I don't care if we get 10 people done or 20 people. It's also about education and gaining trust. Like Jackie said, I think that trust is a factor. And I could tell that at Booker T. I had quite a few people come in and just come in and talk and ask them questions about the vaccine and its safety. Um, and, and there is concern, and, and I get that. So hopefully I helped dispel. I, there was one gentleman in particular that stood out in my mind. He truly believed unless his whole family got vaccinated, it wouldn't be beneficial for him and his son to get vaccinated if the other ones weren't. And I told them that it's always beneficial to get one or two because it's about protecting yourselves. And yes, we want to hit the whole family, but better to do some than none. Um, and he, he did not come back with his son to get vaccinated, by the way. But I'm hoping the next time we come there that potentially there will be. We also um, were limited a little bit in time there because they do do a great service to the community with their children's programs at Booker T., so we have to be out of there by two because the after school programs start, right? So as we move towards summer, um, Ebony and I spoke and we're going to do some more evenings because I do believe we need to meet people where they're at and when they're available. Um, so we're gonna move to evenings and, and potentially go out there while they're having maybe a game. Um, they do the ballparks out there. So if we're there when they're there, um, we have a bigger potential of having people maybe stop by and come in. So that is the work we're doing right now. We're doing much more very small community based. Um, and if you guys have any more ideas about where to go, we are going to one of the churches to hit, hit the Hispanic population. St. Julie's, um, there's a very large Hispanic population. There's a lot of misinformation um, there according to Father um, Pucky. They, he, they just have a lot of misinformation. So we're gonna reach out. We're also, Jacob's reaching out to some of the African American churches to see also if we can come there and do a Sunday um, during services or after services. So just again, much of what Jackie's doing, we're trying to also do, um, we just kind of did ours a little bit more in reverse because we did our big clinics first to try to get numbers in. Um, that's where my head was at and that's where I thought we needed to meet COVID. I think we're now at that point where we're not gonna get those big numbers anymore. So we're gonna cease our operations at the fairgrounds. We're still there to do our second doses for the next four weeks to get that finished up, but now we're gonna be very community-based and go in little community settings. So it's it's been a long haul, y'all. I do get sleep, Jackie gets sleep too. We just, we catch it whenever we can. My husband will tell you I sleep during every uh, TV show that he thinks I should be watching, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't, I don't feel the need to watch TV right now. I have, I have enough drama going on elsewhere in my life. So, 
but thank you all for for organizing this and being this and i'm so glad i, I had some minutes that i could join i wasn't sure um, I have a doctor's appointment today, so I wasn't sure what time I needed to go to get there, but I'm glad to join you all today. Hey, we're very grateful to have your voice in the room. It's an important voice, and I think the work that you've been doing along with Jackie and certainly Jenny Baylor as well for the whole county just cannot be appreciated enough because the three of you as our city and county commissioners are literally saving lives every single day. I'm certain none of you anticipated a pandemic in your lifetime, and this forever changes all of us, but particularly you as professional women in the way you reflect on yourselves and probably the world around you. And I just, for one, say thank you for this amazing work. This amazing work. Thank you. I think I'd like to, to shift to um, a question for each of you as panelists, and then we'll have some time here. We're heading to the last 15 minutes of our segment to answer a few questions. And the question that I have for each of you as panelists is if you could make one change to support the continuing work to reduce racial disparities around healthcare in our county and in our respective city, what would it be in your mind? And this is the proverbial, if you could wave a magic wand, what is your number one priority in your own mind? And Kay, since you have an appointment and need to leave early, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. Sure. I, I think if I ruled the world, <laughs> we have to bite off the trust factor. That, that's where we have to start. Um, we've got to stop being in these isolates and talk, like Jackie, I, I think she hit the nail on the head, the systemic racism, we've got to acknowledge that it's there and we've got to start gaining trust both with each other and with our society as a whole. And the only way to do that in my mind is to be there for each other. We, we have to be present in the moment. We have to be willing to listen and hear each other's thoughts. And we have to be willing to openly discuss and point out our, all of us have shortcomings and I'm more than willing to hear them at any point in time um, because I'm a work in progress and I will never be finished. I'm, I'm not gonna be a Picasso anytime soon. So keep helping me work to that end, so trust is that magical thing for me. I believe we, we've got to work on trust. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kay. Jackie, I'm gonna to move to you next. I, I, I'm trying to think about that. If I could do something that would be really thinking outside the box would be placing everybody in some lived type of experience so that we can really see and feel that experience, um, that that you know that um, hard conversation, that courageous conversation, for everybody to, for one year to commit to being uncomfortable. We've talked about this before, at least one time a week. And if you're really courageous, three times a week. Just get somewhere where just you up in your feelings and you feel some kind of way, and evaluate mm -hmm. that because I think that's when we grow. And to recognize and realize, and I can only speak for myself, is that, you know, I'm a lover of people. And it's very little that people can do for me not to like them. Even the ones I don't particularly care for, I still love them. And so <laughs> if we all get to that place where we're all one, I can't succeed without you, Wendy. I can't, you know, when we get to that place, then even when we feel some kind of way, we're going to be there for each other. And so if I could just make people, I, I can tell you I'm in, in this teary kind of way because um, what happened to George Floyd happened to all of us. For sure. I don't think people feel like that. I don't think, I think it's a them and a us and them type thing, but I was yeah. feeling that physically and emotionally and I still do today. And I'm not joyous about the decision and I'm still kind of out of sorts. 
But I don't think anybody in my close circle here in this organization, for instance, Wendy, and I appreciate this conversation, I don't think they realize it. I think my coworkers and I think my city organization feel like I'm the same person that I've always been these last 20 years. And I have, uh, and I'm not. And so I think sometimes that's the, if I could change things, we would all get in a position that we could have that lived experience so that we can not be so quick to judge and we can be, you know, um, loving and kind and empathetic. So that would be it. Thank you, Jackie, for that courage and that vulnerability. That means a lot in a public space like this. So mm -hmm. thank you. Rhonda, I'm going to shift to you from Primary Health Solutions. You know, you're wearing your hat um, as a FQHC. What would you change to help reduce health, health disparities if you could wave that magic wand in our community? Representing PHS, I would say I, I want people and organizations to understand the importance of this conversation, the weightiness. We all should care. You know, personally, where I'm going to tag on to my sister friend, Jackie. Um, I believe we're called to love and serve each other. You know, when one suffers, we should all be troubled. And she and I've had some hard conversations and um, so appreciate her remarks. Um, I want people to be aware, you know, just wave the wand and we all care. Mm -hmm. um, what a difference. You know, we see what happens when resource and time and caring gets thrown to an issue like infant mortality. There's positive results. So um, stepping up, you know, higher view, we have to, again, you know, come together in unity and love and understand our responsibility as citizens of the earth um, as, as brothers and sisters to come together around the important things. And I think in this hour, nothing is more important um, than, than the love that we need to share. So there, there's that little sermonette. And with that, we'll move to the next. Thank you, Rhonda. Dr. Hamilton, I'm going to move to you because I'd like for you to speak from your experience in your role there at Miami University. And then Councilwoman Vaughn, I'll end with you because you represent um, someone elected for the people to make sure that the voice is heard. And I want you to talk about what you see as a, as a priority. So Dr. Hamilton, if you'll start. Sure, thank you, Wendy. I think I, I've been thinking about this and, and I think the biggest thing that I could do is, is continue to be a connector that I'm a relational leader. And as, as Jackie and Rhonda talked about uh, and, and Kay as well, it's about gaining that trust, trust but I, I think I would just, I would continue to do the work, but outside of Miami University, I would actually do it in the community and talk to the people that were uh, most greatly affected by those health disparities. And <clears throat> one of the things that I love about Hamilton and Middletown is that those are communities, those are communities are very closely knit people. And it's sometimes difficult to um, gain entree if you're an outsider, but I think I would change my position and, and again, not come with wearing a Miami University lens or um, Miami University hat, but just as a community activist. And I, I would talk to the people and talk to them about my experiences and, and talk to them about theirs. But in gaining that entree, talk to them from a place of well, guess what I heard, or so-and-so got the vaccination um, and, and they seem to be okay, or I got the vaccination and I, I'm okay. But I would just talk to them from a different place, but it would come, uh, as Jackie said, uh, and Rhonda, place of love, but just change that hat and change that focus because I would want the trust factor to be there as well and not appear to be an outsider who was coming in to tell people what they need. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Susan, will you share your thoughts with us? Sure, thank you. Well, I think if, if I could, I would wave the magic wand and create equity and opportunity in all of our neighborhoods. Um, if I had a really big wand, it would be the entire country, but let's start in our neighborhood. I think that, um, I think we often see that neighborhoods 
um, impact individual's destiny, where you live, eat, breathe, sleep, go to school, create your destiny. And I've learned over the past 18 months being on city council, I've visited neighborhoods that I was never in before. I talked to people I was never in before. Um, and I've learned so much about the neighborhoods and I see the inequities in those neighborhoods. You know, right now, one of the things that surprised me the other day when Kay gave her stats on COVID was that our Lindenwald neighborhood, which tends to be one of our older neighborhoods, a lot of people stay there very close knit, but that one had the fewest people that had vac been vaccinated. It was, I believe, 21%, which was a very low number. And I was surprised and I thought, what is it about the neighborhood that has, has caused them not to come forward? So the inequities show up in lots of different ways, whether it's our children in school or it's you know, getting your COVID vaccination or your ability to get to a grocery store. Um, I would love to wave that wand that says there is equity and we all understand, respect each other and there are equal opportunities. I don't think we'd be having this conversation if that were the case. Thank you very much for that statement. I think at this point we have about 10 minutes left in our program and I have been um, promising all of you that we'll be very diligent because everyone's time is so valuable to start on time and end on time. So I'd like to open up for questions from the audience, if they have specific questions of the, the panelists, we'd like to allow that at this moment, and then we'll have some closing closing statements. So does anyone have a question for any one of our panelists? And while you're thinking that through, I give acknowledgement to April Hamlin, who is the Chief Operations Officer here at the YWCA, who is helping with the technology behind the scenes. While you may not be able to see her, there's lots of work going on uh, behind the scenes. So thank you, April. Questions from the audience or comments for that matter. I, I have a comment. Um, my name is Jennifer Carter and I am the president of Aqua, the Ohio Community Health Workers Association. And one of the things that we were talking about what was important, what would help to uh, possibly get something started with the communities and I think it's respect. I think respect runs a long way. I think that um, respect people for what they know, respect people who they are, and not assume that they don't know because they're a certain race or a certain color or however they want to phrase that. And I just think it's important that we respect each other. Um, I have a lot of respect for our city commissioner, because I've watched her, our health commissioner rather, I've watched her go through the infant mortality program. I've watched her with this COVID and I think she's amazing, but she respect people. And that's, I think that's the key. I've watched her and at a city council meeting and make everyone in that council feel like they were somebody just by, respecting them. And, and I think respect is the key. Once we start respecting each other, I think we'll go a long way. Trust, I mean, trust will come with respect. If you respect someone, then trust will come. But first you need to, we need to practice that respect. Even I'm thinking of even our Senate, when one woman is talking and the man feels like he has more to say than she has to say, and he butts in and don't let her talk. I think it's just, we need to get some respect, a lot of respect. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. I appreciate that. I do. Other questions or comments from the audience, for our panelists? I, yeah, can I'm, I speak, Wendy? Uh, go ahead, Kim. No, go. Oh, I was, I was, was going to fill space. You know, I can always do that. Go. <laughs> um, 
You know, I was thinking uh, if we are all, the pandemic has put us in a space to what you were speaking about, um, Jackie, in terms of a collective trauma, we have somewhat of a space to work from to talk about um, ACEs and some of the kinds of things we experience on a regular basis that are traumatic, that we have an ex collective experience to move from. Um, and, and look at how do we mitigate for that trauma and ACEs and all of that. And where do we begin? It's so large in terms of um, what we experience on a, on a daily basis for some of us, collectively the pandemic. So where do we start to do that? And um, you know, where, where is it most effective because it is so large? Uh, um. I can just say with with trauma because you know I love tra I love talking about trauma. Look, I love trauma. I think the first place and 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 Dr. Hamilton, my sister Bernice is going to have to help me here. The first place is acknowledging it. I mean, you know, like anything, you have to acknowledge it, and that's why I love this right. conversation. You got to talk about it, and you got to lo love each other, respect each other, all of that's it. But you got to talk because if you don't talk about it, it's not happening. And when it's not happening, you're not heard. You're not listened to, you get depressed. And, and it doesn't, it just builds and builds and another problem comes out. So the first place, all this big trauma, just acknowledge it. Everybody's feeling bad where it sucks to wear a mask. It's you're tired of being at home. You're tired of being afraid. You're tired of being told what to do. You just gotta acknowledge it. And then you work from that, I think. I mean, that's where I would, that's where I start every day. Mm -hmm. It's a great statement, Jackie. We have just a few minutes left, so I want to make sure that our panelists get a chance to make a closing statement. Any thoughts that you've had as a result of participating in this panel today? Anything that you want to make sure is said in the space that has not yet been said? And Rhonda, I know you're struggling the most with technology and connections. I'm going to start with you while I have you live and you're able to speak. <laughs> Um, just once again, I just, I feel so honored to be in the room with such beautiful um, people. Uh, Wendy, the work that you do is just incredible. And so many of, of these lovely faces that I see on my screen, you know, you've been working hard at being heard and, and, and really in a way that, um, you know, you've moved mountains, you've moved mountains in this community. And I just, I'm, I'm humbled to be here with you. So just nothing but love and respect and appreciation. And I hope that this is the beginning of some very great work uh, in the days ahead. Thank you, Rhonda. Councilwoman Vaughn, would you like to go next? Sure. Well, I would just want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing. And uh, I really look forward to continuing the conversation, to working with you, to doing whatever I can. Please, please uh, contact me if you have ideas or thoughts. I will do my part at the city level to work with our neighborhoods to really focus on uh, the issues of disparity across the board. I just think that's critical. Uh, in our communities. And I know that we work with Middletown, we work with Fairfield, we can't do this alone. And so all of the wisdom that you all have, I truly appreciate it and look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, how about you? Just quickly, cause I talk a lot. I'm gonna say everybody's name that I see here, Kendra and Rhonda and Usawa. Molly, Kay, Diane, April, Mallory, Nikki, Miss Brock, Shannon, Miss Jackson, Bernice, Susan, and Wendy. It takes, and Jenny, did I get Jenny and Kim? Takes every one of us, you guys. We have to represent. So often, I'm a big mouth. I'm, I'm, I'm 60, I'm comfortable talking, and I don't care what people think. You know, you get on the other side, you don't care what people think. But it takes each and every one of us to turn this around. And so be present, represent, be bold. Don't think your ideas are too small or are not large enough. Don't think it's stupid. We need to speak up and we need to represent and we can change things. 
And so I won't quit. I won't quit fighting. I get tired, <laughs> but I won't quit fighting. Love everybody, love each other and be there for each other because we can't do it alone. So thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Dr. Hamilton, I give the floor to you for closing comments. Thank you, Andy. In order to recognize that there are problems, you have to address, you have to acknowledge them and realize that uh, that acknowledgement says that I too understand that they exist. The conversation has been started. And I, my hope is that the conversation between you and Susan continues, the conversation with you and other women or other panelists continues. We just happen to be all women, but it does not stop there. Um, I think that it now's the time, as, as Jackie said, to be bold and courageous and to take that next stand. Look at what our brothers and sisters have done in, in communities that are next door to us and communities that are next door in, in those states. They've taken that step. They still exist. We acknowledge that it exists and we do something about it. It's time to put pen to paper and say, this is happening and this is what I'm going to do to make a difference. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I thank all of our panelists today as we come to the close of this important discussion around health disparities in the week of YWCA USA's Stand Against Racism. In the chat while we were live here during the panel conversation, you received a copy of the Stand Against Racism pledge. And while a pledge in and of itself does not feel material, what I would say to you the very first time I signed it, I had a shift inside my body because it calls to action the courage to stand up when racism is happening and take action at that moment. So I urge you to download that pledge. Please consider signing it. Please consider sharing it with all of your family and friends because we need everyone to join us in this work. The YWCA's mission is to eliminate racism first and foremost and to empower women. We do so by promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. We are committed to this space and we have an amazing gift that will help support it in the future. So there will be new team members joining the YWCA who will help us in this space of racial equity. And I'm so excited about that. And many of you know, we also have a building project going on. So we're just gonna be really, really busy in the city of Hamilton and in Butler County. And we are proud and humble to be connected with women as esteemed as those as our pain. So I thank you again. And this has been recorded. We'll make it available through Facebook so that folks who could not attend today may have a chance to at least hear the pearls of wisdom these amazing individuals have shared. We thank you. Take the pledge. Thank you. Love you guys. Have Thanks. a great day, y'all. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everyone.